I'm Elise Hugh. And I'm Josh Klein. And we're the hosts of Built for Change, a podcast from Accenture. On Built for Change, we're talking to business leaders from every corner of the world that are harnessing change to reinvent the future of their business. We're discussing ideas like the importance of ethical AI or how productivity soars when companies truly listen to what their employees value. These are insights that leaders need to know to stay ahead. So subscribe to Built for Change wherever you get your podcasts. If you live in Las Vegas, you got gripes. And sometimes I think it's our city's official pastime. Big and small, super important, or maybe, I don't know, just a personal beef. As much as we all love our city, somehow we think it'll be a little better if they, whoever they are, listens to our complaints. So today on CityCast Las Vegas, we give it to the city. Former co-host Vogue Robinson, newsletter editor Scott Dickensheets and I sit down for a cathartic gripe sesh, and you're all invited along. It's Wednesday, September 13th. I'm David Figler, and here's what Las Vegas is talking about. Scott, Vogue, welcome to CityCast Las Vegas. Good morning. Happy to be here, Dave. Me and my spleen, ready to go. (laughs) All right. Scott, let's vent that spleen. And tell us, what is your top Vegas gripe? Oh, David, I've I've got a number of them. And I will set aside my normal starter on this topic, and I won't complain about Allegiant Stadium. This is not my top gripe. It's probably my cheapest, pettiest, lowest, meanest gripe. Ooh. And that is... How do you own a business and operate a business in, in this town, in the desert, without ceiling fans? So Business after business <laughs> oh, wait, after business. Wait. The, ceiling fans. Ceiling yes. fans. Ceiling fans. All, all right. Brother, I'm, I'm ready to jump on that truck with you. You just got to bring it home for me. Well, it may be that I have the, you know, the metabolism of a water buffalo, but <laughs> I go into a lot of places and there's no ceiling fan. There's a, there's a coffee shop I love in Henderson. But it has these big east-facing windows, gets a lot of sun. After about 10, 15 minutes of nursing a coffee in there, the stale air just gets to me, and I got a bolt. I got a bolt. Like, I love every molecule of the writer's block. But when I stand in there looking at, you know, lovingly going over all the books, the air in there just gets a little a little tight. I won't say I cut my visit short. I cut it shorter than I would like to. But for me, in a desert town, if you're wooing people in and you want yes. them to spend time there. There's one way to woo. You, you've got to make it more comfortable. Move the air. And so, <laughs> I, and I find this time after time after time. I'm, this is not an isolated gripe, as my wife will uh, certainly attest. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, I feel like that's a true writer-like complaint. That's, that's coming from a person who spends a lot of time outside of their home writing. <laughs> it's like, this place <laughs> needs to be much more comfortable. <laughs> also, you know, it's technically an artificial bird sanctuary, so they don't have fans so that the artificial birds don't get caught up in the fans. <laughs> oh, fair point. How about you, Vogue? What uh, really, I don't know, grinds your gears about this? Grinds Las Vegas? my gears. I was trying to dig into the practical complaints, kind of, sort of. I suppose. But my biggest complaint is actually regarding health care out here. Every time my husband and I have found a primary care doctor that we kind of sort of liked, they were an attending or they were like a resident. And so we had them for a year and then boop, off to Wisconsin, boop, off to California, boop, off to some other city. And so then it, it almost feels like my files get lost also. So then I mm. have to start with a new doctor and it's like, oh, didn't nobody take notes on my conditions? I got a few. I don't want to have to explain myself to you every time, but it just, it feels like there isn't enough care in our healthcare and there aren't enough practitioners. And even now, like I've asked my therapist, like, do you have any ideas for a good primary care doctor? And she was like, shrug, here's a nurse (laughs) practitioner that I kind of sort of like that's good. But I mean, do you two have a consistent primary care doctor that you go to? No, I don't because Damn it, the the insurance often changes, or or the doctor changes yeah. insurances. But Vogue, I can I can one hundred percent sympathize. My late brother had a year long odyssey through the healthcare system in this town mm. before he passed away, and like facility after facility seemed there 
main purpose seemed to be to like frack his insurance for every last dollar they could get before passing him along to the next provider. And that might be a, a worldwide or countrywide issue, but it certainly is a problem here. Uh, there is, uh, I'm just going to call it brain drain, you know, people leaving our mm -hmm. community. There is that, you know, an old joke that I'm going to do the setup for. And I know Scott Dickenshees is going to know the punchline. We have not set this up ahead of time on any level, but I'm going to do this. Scott, where is the best place to go in Las Vegas to make sure you get good health care? The airport, David. Boom. Oh, no. <laughs> I mean, that's that's mine. I'm, I feel like I took it to a very dark place. <laughs> well, I mean, that's a big one for, for our community, but you yeah. want me to do one too? Yeah, David, what's, what's your top Vegas gripe? I'm going to take a page from Allegiant Stadium, Scott, <laughs> so you don't have to. Uh, well, I'm just going to say in general, architecture, especially on the Strip, has just become crap. Uh, and I appreciate whoever is designing the one generic building that most oh. casinos look like now <laughs> to the point where literally the resorts world gets sued by the wind for copying the same generic kind of tall curve building the, Wait, the signage is that, a thing? that was real oh, oh yeah. my god yeah okay, while sorry. the resource world was being built they got sued like a cease and desist basically from the wind like stop trying to copy us and i'm like well do you look at the strip your building looks too much like my building they all kind of look alike i mean this is very different from the 1970s learning from las vegas era exactly when all of the buildings had this unique character that they were innovative and interesting that yes they served the you know the purpose of commerce but also left something so stunning uh, as to capture the imagination of the world and mm. that's not what i see on the strip right now whether it be the fountain blue or resorts world the two newest on the strip to the death star of allegiant stadium i mean it's all sort of generic building generic big death star i i, I think it's like the you know, Roomba. it's, it's like, a giant Roomba, david giant Roomba. It, it's become very generic the signage all looks the same and it's so ostentatious and it doesn't really serve any aesthetic that's my gripe my gripe is we stopped being interesting on the strip yeah uh, wow you look at the win and and encore and they could be the headquarters of a you know, of a giant healthcare company or something. Uh, you know, an insurance conglomerate could could live in those buildings. And nothing about it says Las Vegas or you know or excitement. I'm excited for the big the the new big guitar. I'm like at least it's different, and it's so funny. And the only reason I even feel that way is because Scott. I feel like when we were getting the sphere, you were like, "Bring it," because it'll change our skyline. <laughs> and so, <I'm, laughs> David, I got number raspberries. <laughs> I see. It's just bombast without thought or style. I mean, I don't think I would have described the strip at any point. Um, As bombast post. without thought or style? Come on. That's exactly what the strip is, Vogue. It, well, and that's what I'm saying. Like, you're upset about it continuing its own tradition. Mm. A tradition that? that started with the Mirage, I think. So maybe <laughs> 30 years ago. <laughs> Trying to keep up with all the great things happening in Vegas can feel impossible. If you want a list of things to do in town, curated by locals, then you want to go to the list.vegas. I love it because it's easy to read and easy to navigate. You can search the calendar for cool events or filter by category. Everything from local theater to classical music, food festivals to improv comedy, from dance to delicious dining. If it's worth checking out, it's on the list.vegas. No intrusive ads, no social media, just the goods. Plus, you can subscribe for their free weekly newsletter for personal event recommendations, discount codes, ticket alerts, and inside scoops. You've probably heard publisher Andrew Corrali on the podcast. He's a journalist who was born and raised in Las Vegas. He started the list.vegas to keep track of all the fun things he loves to do in his hometown. Now he's sharing it with all of us. Head on over to the list.vegas.
I'm Elise Hugh. And I'm Josh Klein. And we're the hosts of Built for Change, a podcast from Accenture. On Built for Change, we're talking to business leaders from every corner of the world that are harnessing change to reinvent the future of their business. We're discussing ideas like the importance of ethical AI or how productivity soars when companies truly listen to what their employees value. These are insights that leaders need to know to stay ahead. So subscribe to Built for Change wherever you get your podcasts. All right. Well, let's let's do a round two. I'm I'm feeling feisty now. Let's see where this goes. Scott, you ready? I'm ready, round David. Two. Round two. What's your next <laughs> round? Uh, and th- this is a, a little personal, but I I'm really unhappy with the dearth of arts and cultural criticism in this town. Mm. As we record this, there's a cover story on the Las Vegas Weekly about you know the ups and downs of the city's visual arts scene here. They don't really talk about much about the lack of of criticism. Or, or writers who write about the arts too much. But I think that's a real missing component. Uh, and I, I think that's not sort of an in-house niche concern amongst, you know, the, the culturati or something. I think there's a wide nimbus of people around the arts who might be tempted to be more engaged with it if somebody gave them a way to think about it instead mm. of just like looking at it from afar and thinking, I don't know what to make of this. If, so, if there was a writer who said like, here's a way to think about you can think about this play or this exhibit or whatever. Hmm. And uh, David, I know your your next question. You're going to ask me, Scott, who's to blame for this? Um, so go ahead. Yes, name names. Okay. Who's to blame? <laughs> well, I would say like 40% of the problem is the media. Nobody employs any or even has any freelance cultural critics anymore. No reviewers, no any of that is going on now. And I blame them for not having sort of a willingness to invest in in a sort of long-term community good. But 60% is on us, the readers. One reason, one big reason the Review Journal stopped using its uh, theater critics and movie critics and, and so on, music critics, is because the metrics told them that not enough people were reading it. And hmm. so all of those in a, of us in the Valley who you know say we love culture and want to support culture, we're not doing it by reading, therefore making a case that there is an engaged audience out there. And so maybe the truth is there isn't. But I put that to somebody in the cultural community whom David I will not name and was told basically, I don't have time for that. And so mm. so my gripe is that those of us who consider ourselves part of the cultural community need to sort of be more determined to support those things that can help bring back that kind of criticism and hopefully draw in more, you know, looky-loos and more people who are on the, <laughs> you know, on the edges More or of less this. lucky lose. You, you want thinkers, it sounds well, like. Well, I want people who are on the edge of the scene and maybe think it might be interested, could be tempted into being interested if they found a way in. Yeah. Hey, folk, does that resonate with you that arts and culture in Las Vegas suffer because of the lack of thoughtful criticism or maybe even any criticism? Uh, and, and when I say criticism, not just, you know, yeah, you know like I mean. that there aren't enough conversations around yeah. around and through the art. And critical I think that, conversations, critical conversations, let's say that. That also comes from, you know, what do people have time for? Like, I think it's it's the culture, like the nature of the culture of the city. I was actually talking to a friend and she actually categorizes the city as like kind of anti-intellectual-ish. In that, you know, a lot of people, if you go into a place and you say that you you have a PhD or you're a professor, people immediately are like, ugh, like they're kind of turned off by you. And so that makes it harder to kind of have those interactions with folks. So I don't know if it's just about criticism, if it's not about support all the way around. So like, what are the art educators doing? How are students being brought into the different locations are students being cr- encouraged right are we are we raising up little art critics uh do people have proper mentorship to even be in that way because we don't really have if there's no current examples out there of any type of criticism somebody writing about their full-fledged opinion about a work then where do you go for inspiration like yes you can google it but like where do you see it within your own community and i'm also thinking about not just the arts and how hard it would be to you know do criticism of people that you interact with all the time or who you might be friends with but how that has really um been detrimental for shows on the strip and shows in general in las vegas is that you're not really getting good criticism and so these shows just sort of limp along not being particularly great and then they fold and everyone wonders why. And it's because no one had the guts 
to call out that these are the problems with the show or this is the thing. And I think a lot of that has to do with in the media, especially access and relationships and things of that nature. Mm-hmm. Nobody wants to say anything bad about, you know, Bette Midler's show. And if they do, the publisher of the journal is going to tell them that they need to retract it or get out of town and they wind up getting out of town. That sounds like a very specific example because that's a very specific example of something <laughs> that, in my understanding, did happen. Oh, um, so David, yeah. I feel like that's your segue. What's your next Vegas gripe? My next Vegas gripe is probably the sort of small town culture of not wanting to piss mm. off anybody that we embrace a little too hard. And mm. I, I think that calling out certain things, sort of bigger concepts that affect us in a big way, like we, we you know, I'm not going to complain about traffic. That's an easy gripe. But I will complain about the fact that we don't dive deep into who is the actual cause of the lack of coordination of traffic efforts or the duration of these traffic things or how Mm. much money we spend on it and whether or not those people are being held accountable. And I think that whenever, especially public funds, are being used for big, important, and what's sold to us as necessary projects that the vendors that they pick, there's just no transparency or accountability. I, I think there's one company that does most of the traffic stuff in this town. I was going to say, are are we here? Are we here? I, I, I mean, you know, why? How powerful are they? How does it all work? How do they keep getting the contracts over anyone else? Are you going to name are, names, David? Well, yeah, LV it? Paving is the one that does all the projects in town. I don't it's know lit. why. And I don't do. I don't know why because there's no reporting on it. There's no examination of this company. There's no examination of the sphere of influence that this one company has or how they are operating in a way, or even measuring whether or not they're operating in a way that even makes sense for our community. But we all have the orange cone dilemma that we are easy to gripe about, but are we willing to really dig deep, if you will, into who is causing these problems and why, and calling them out by name, and that's just not the Vegas way. We don't mess with the juice. Oh, I could go on forever, but I'm not, because I want one more gripe out of you, Vogue Vogue Robinson. I can gripe. It's actually, a, it's a page out of the David book. It's out of the book of David Figler. Uh, oh, no. The lack of affordable housing. I know so many people who are like biding their time in jobs that they, they're okay with these jobs, but they're really riding it out into retirement and trying to maintain just the base like quality of life for themselves. And you know, a part of their soul is dying along the way. And some of that has to do with what they can and can't afford and like where they can live. And if they, if they, God forbid, have to move or they're living in, if they're subletting or they're living in a house that they're renting from someone, then they're at the mercy of their landlord who might decide randomly to sell that house and they got to get out and try and find an apartment. Yeah. And, and who has very favorable eviction laws on the landlord side. Right. I get email from readers all the time about this problem. Any, anytime you mention homelessness or, or, you know, affordable housing, I get emails from people who say, you know, the problem is just like you can't afford a decent place anymore. Yeah. and, And you hit the nail on the head there. It's hard to have this conversation without intertwining homelessness and affordable housing. They're related concepts, but they're very, very separate. Yet as a community, they do seem often to be discussed in the same breath. And it maybe doesn't Mm. help either concept. You know, in in some circles, they stopped calling it affordable housing because there was just this concept that you're just trying to house, you know, the unhoused uh, versus the people who just need it. So they reframed it as workforce housing. Mm. And that's interesting, too, because like teachers, policemen, firemen, just any entry level or, you know, no matter if it's a, a skilled vocation or not, housing takes up 30, 40 percent of people's sometimes way more. Right. And it's like, well, you have to start here. If housing costs X, then you have to accommodate them with salary that is, you know, that percentage more so that they're not going above that threshold of how much they're spending on housing. And that is just a conversation that whether it be our legislature or our community has been very difficult to get a hold of to do the things that are necessary to provide a framework for housing to be affordable for all. So we've got medical, we've got housing, we've got art and culture criticism, we've got architecture. Those are some good big ass gripes that I think we really um, talked very thoughtfully about. And but I'm ceiling also fans. Wondering, and ceiling fans. Let's not forget those ceiling fans. But I, I wonder, well, Scott, tell me, you, you get all these listener emails. What are our listeners who write in griping about? Mm-hmm. 
Well, lately, I mean, I asked readers what their gripes were recently, and, and almost all the ones I got in response were subsets of traffic sucks here. <laughs> but it, oddly enough, it wasn't about you know traffic on the freeway or it wasn't about orange cones. It was like super specific things like the lights are too long and mistimed, or there's an intersection at Wyoming and Main Street that's badly designed and you can't figure out where you're supposed to go. Yeah. Truth. And, Facts. Facts. <laughs> absolutely. You know what? I will file all that. And as much as, you know, we do like to complain about traffic, just the planning of this community it doesn't ever seem to be more than, well, we want more people to keep coming, so let's accommodate more people just coming. put a street without, right there. Yeah, yeah, right. Do we as Las Vegans maybe just like to complain? Do we complain so much that we could be categorized as just a bunch of haters? Or are we legit here? Is this is this gripe session healthy? I'm going to err toward the latter and say it, it's a bit healthy. I think a certain amount of griping is just how you sort of maintain equilibrium in a place like this. But I will say, you know, the bulk of communications I get from readers of the newsletter are not necessarily gripey. If I ask, you know, what's your opinion of something, they might give a negative one. But I don't get a lot of like free-floating, gripey angst hmm. from the readership. So I assume that that's probably somewhat true of, of a, the larger community. Or, or maybe I'm just, I have blinkers on. Who knows? <laughs> what about you, Vogue? Are we too much of a complaining society? No. I, for me, I, I, the complaint is the catalyst. So I might start in a zone of like, this is trash, but also, okay, well, then what are the things that can be done to transform it? How can we, you know, fix some of these problems? And I think also some of our complaints also become conversations that we end up having on the podcast. And then we get to talk to people about, well, why is this thing this way? Why did this thing become this? So I think the the further we get into analyzing the complaints and trying to find the root of those issues gives us the space to make the changes. But if we never complain, if we never speak up, then how are we going to make those changes? Yeah, I think there's a natural human inclination to think I've griped about it. Ergo, I've done something. No. That I don't have to do anymore. No, no, no. <laughs> Armchair warriors. <laughs> right? What say you, David? Well, you know, uh, whether or not Las Vegas is a city you love to hate or hate to love or whatever, I think we all love to gripe. And I wish it had more of an impact on the way that things get done. But I, I don't disagree that sometimes the gripe seems to be its own reward as opposed to the change that the gripe could you know, lead to. And maybe that is the direction we need to go. That'd be interesting, though, if if actual gripes became actual, oh, I don't know, policy to make things better. That'd be great. I think it could. Amen to that. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, well, this has been a delightful gripe session. And I'm going to, if nothing else, take from this conversation to talk to Scott and Drew over at Writer's Block and convince them to put in a ceiling fan. That'll be my <laughs> legacy for Las Vegas. That'll be the GoFundMe. And then my gripe will have led to action and I will be satisfied. <laughs> Vogue, Scott, hey, fun gripe session. Let's do this again sometime. Absolutely. Sounds good. That's all for today here on CityCast Las Vegas. If you enjoyed the show, share this episode with your friend who complains about Vegas the most. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. Take care. What's the Henderson Coffee Shop? Oh, I don't want to out them. I don't. Do I want? Do I really want to out Public Works Coffee Bar? I don't know. What if, <laughs> not really. Oh, oh, see, that was giving one of my gripes is that we never out anyone by name, only by concept. But there you go. Look at you, Scott. <laughs>